The car behind me is a Cisitalia 202 Coupe. It's a car that was built in 1947. And uh, it's uh, the only car, uh, as far as uh, we know, that's uh, been on show, on a permanent exhibition on the uh, Art Museum, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I think uh, industrial design and car design can be seen as a form of art because it's a way of express, expressing ideas and feeling in the search of something beautiful. Italian car is a legend and an enigma. A magical alliance between craft work and technology that has created the ultimate classic. The 1990 Idea Ferrari exhibition in Florence commemorated the death of founder Enzo Ferrari and his celebrated legacy the unique position Ferrari now occupies in Italian culture. But these cars, indeed all Italian cars, are the product of an historic double act. Manufacturers build the mechanical parts of the car and subcontract the design of the outer shell to bodybuilders or carrozzeria. These wooden formers, or bucks, were carved by bodybuilders Pininfarina. Then metal skins were shaped over them to produce the car bodies that covered Ferrari's mechanical parts. This relationship has its origins in the medieval skills of hand-beating metal plate for armor. It is the key to the shape of Italian cars. Now these cars stand guarded and fussed over, enshrined in specially built glass cubes and displayed as immobile works of art. They are, without doubt, landmarks in the history of car design and to the Italians as culturally significant as the Renaissance city below. Winner of many famous races, including the Mille Emilia and the Le Mans 24 Hours, this 1949 MM is the earliest car on show. An open-top two-seater, or barchetta, it was beautifully designed by the now-defunct Milanese coach builders, Touring. With its detuned engine and longer chassis, this 166 Inter of 1950 was Ferrari's first attempt to capture the sporting saloon market. Turing's advanced body shape, reminiscent of Pininfarina's earlier Cisitalia, proved that a saloon could also be a taut and lithe form. For the 1959 racing season, Pininfarina designed the shape of Ferrari's 250 Testa Rosa, or Redhead. These simple flowing shapes look more aerodynamic than they really are. Even when stationary, it has the appearance of a car traveling at 100 miles an hour. The last front-engined racing Ferrari, the 250 GTO, was built from 1962 to 1964. Gallietti's muscular and aggressive bodywork made it one of their most instantly collectible cars. The early 60s was a period of frantic experiment. The curiously successful combination of curves and straight lines in this 250 Le Mans 
is the result of genuine wind tunnel aerodynamics and the need to keep such a fast car on the road. Built by Scaglietti and based on a Pininfarina design, this 250 GT is one of the most famous and beautiful of all Ferraris, the definitive gentleman's sports car and as instantly recognizable as any famous work of art. It is an icon for its time. Its solemn face and egg crate grille pattern as well as the heavily dished wire wheels derived from Ferrari's earlier race winners. By now, some details were becoming Ferrari signatures For Italians, cars, particularly sports cars, are meant to transport the emotions as well as the body. And so those who have succeeded in this enigmatic trick are revered in the same way as Leonardo or Puccini. How did companies like Pininfarina manage to turn mere bodybuilding into art? Head of the design studios at Pininfarina, Lorenzo Ramacciotti. Since in Italy there were no uh, design school. I attended um, an engineering uh, school and then uh, I found the occasion to join Pininfarina that was uh, in my eye the most prominent name in car design. So it's uh, working here is the fulfillment of, uh, of an ambition and uh, uh, I think this is true for many people who works, work here. Uh, that is you don't become a car designer just by chance, but uh, in general, because you strongly want it from, uh, from childhood. This car, for today's standard, doesn't look revolutionary. But uh, if you go back to 1947, this front is very untypical and uh, retains a lot of uh, uh, modern feeling. We have something that's very neat. We only have the lamps and the air intake. And the air intake, instead of being vertical, as usual at the time, is strongly horizontal. And this gives a lot of the width to the car, instead of giving the, it height. And also the bonnet is much lower than the fenders. So the, the front appearance of the car is something of wide and low, even if the car is not uh, the big size. On the side, we have a very clean surface. Without being a completely pontoon, there is a, a small bulge for the fenders. The car is very smooth. And there are some specific hints for aerodynamic, like the V-curved windshield. But at, at the time, it was not available a curved screen. And so the, the screen is split in two parts. And even the, the handles are of flush type. You just press the button to have the handle and open the door. So there is attention to the proportion, but also to the detail, to obtain a really uh, integrated, uh, smooth and aerodynamic design. Then, uh, slightly more modern, we have another very interesting car. It's the Lancia Aurelia B20. This car is a, it's a milestone for Pininfarina, since it marks the passage from the coach builder to the production manufacturer. In fact, only 3,000 cars were, were built, but all of them were the same, and it was the first start of a series production at Pininfarina. Also relevant for its design, the car is very sporty, though being very comfortable. This, I think, is the very first example of post-war Italian GT car. It's a very performing car with a very elegant and smooth shape. Uh, particularly interesting the treatment of the side that's completely flush. The low and long uh, shape of the windows and the, cu the curve, very gentle, of the tail, this two, two volume, two box shape. That's uh, also in this case, we don't see any decoration, any ornamentation. It's just the volume, the proportion, and the sculpturing of the details that makes the car. These Pininfarina designs are essentially studies in body form. The bizarre shape of this Pininfarina X prototype 
followed innovative research into airflow. And this beautiful, record-breaking 1965 Arbas Coupe special is a further example of the tireless obsession Italian carrozzeria have with shape and experimentation. When you are working on a car, you are doing really a sculpture and uh, you have to work with it to get the best of the surface you are working on. So there is a kind of personal feeling about uh, the car between the designer and the product itself. I think uh, this particular feeling, uh, you can see it in many Italian designs. Coming to Ferraris and Pininfarina, the fact that Pininfarina worked for such a long time with Ferrari uh, gave us the chance to establish a certain design uh, feeling about Ferrari that's very typical to it and very typical of Pininfarina. And uh, in, in Ferrari cars, you sometimes find uh, very strong design uh, hints that are always related to something functional, like the air intakes on the Testarossa and the 348. That are, are there because the uh, radiators are mounted on the side instead of being mounted on the front. And at the same time, they are used to define the personality of the car. Pininfarina is only one of half a dozen Italian coach builders. Ferrari, simply one of their most famous clients. But some Italian classics are so obscure that even Italians would not recognize them. The Italians are not the only admirers of the Italian car. Baritone Chris Lackner is an obsessive ESO enthusiast. This 5-litre 1967 ESO Revolta, designed by Bertone, belongs to his Texan girlfriend, Alison. Predominantly designed for the American market, these hybrid cars appealed to those who wanted Italian or European style with the familiarity of an American engine and automatic gearbox. Having been seduced by the delights of Allison's car, Chris started a two-year search for an ESO of his own. Open. Having found it, he soon discovered that its price bore no relation to its performance. He came to me and he said, I have seen this car, it is absolutely fabulous, and I've got to buy it. And I said, really? And he said, uh, yes, and uh, I don't know where I'm going to get the money. Then he borrowed money from the bank, he borrowed every penny he could, and came to me in desperation at the very last. So I said, well, if you really want it that badly and you think it's, you know, a good car and a good price, well, so I loaned him the money and I guess it took him about three years to pay me back. Uh, I knew I had to have it and you don't come across a seven litre very often. In fact, uh, it's the only one I'd ever seen at that point and we only got two in this country anyway. I bought it about three years ago, uh, minus an engine, as you can see. That's where it goes. I had the chance of buying a with or without and I could only scrape up the money to buy it without. I haven't, I'm afraid, yet got round to doing anything much about it. Uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to the day when I can get behind the wheel and see what 96 and first gear feels like. Basically, the car's pretty good. It's in that nice, unrestored, unmucked about with sort of condition. Sometimes I think I take my hobby more seriously than my career. I console myself for the fact that Pavarotti is a keen Maserati enthusiast. While Chris waits until he can afford to restore his car to its original condition, 
he can be happy in the knowledge that his ESO is now worth ten times what he paid for it, even without an engine. The World Centre for Insurance. Its members gamble with the destiny of ships, planes, space shuttles and cars. Yet some members take more than a purely professional interest in their work. Lloyd's broker, Alex Feisch. I am a director of uh, Lloyd's Breaking Company by the name of Leslie and Godwin. I come and transact or negotiate rates and terms from underwriters on certain classes of business. These days, now I specialize more in fine art insurance, uh, which has latterly, over the last few years, encompassed classic motor cars, because classic motor cars are now, in many circles, termed as a fine art object, uh, rather than just a set of wheels to be driven around the road on. I think I went to my very first motor race meeting, taken by my father, uh, at the age of nine or ten and I think that was the recipe for disaster because from that moment onwards I've always been totally absorbed by the subject. You know where reverse is, don't you? Just one of the twelve cars in Alex's priceless collection, this Ferrari 365 is almost too valuable to be driven on the road. Ironically, one of the many problems for the serious car collector is the transportation of the very object designed for seductive and fast transport. Existing for purely aesthetic reasons, the striking flying buttresses of this 1977 Maserati Merak SS continue the line of the car. Its distinctive 70s shape was created by Giugiaro at Ital Design. Each car is different in its own right, it's a different character. Um, and that is the thing with Italian motor cars, that they have a definite charisma. Just old. This 1961 Oscar is completely hand-built and very rare. It was designed by the Maserati brothers following their departure from the Maserati company. They have characters. And, for example, a the chap who built it on a Monday, he might put a certain switch to do a certain job in one place, and on a Tuesday he changes his mind and wants to put it somewhere else. So he put it somewhere else. Do you know where reverse is? Are you going to do it? Okay. Oh, um, Kevin. Yeah. What? Kevin. 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 reverse. Which way is reverse? Over against the strength. Right over there. Yeah. Okay. okay. Oscar is an example of one of the many eccentric small production companies that existed in Italy during the post-war period. You had no instruction books with any sensible meaning of those cars in the early days. Those you did have an instruction book, they were always for left-hand drive and always in a foreign language. So, I mean, it's a challenge. And they are a challenge to drive, and to maintain, and keep them going as they should be. Bizzarini, engineer Giotto Bizzarini, has been involved in the design of many Italian makes a motor car. He um, was probably the most famous motor car that he designed was the Ferrari 250 GTO at the time that he worked for Ferrari. Uh, he also worked for Lamborghini. He designed the first V12 Lamborghini engine. And he then also was responsible for the Iso, Grifo and Revolta chassis. And penultimately, he made this own car, his own car called a Bizzarini. It's a very interesting car because this car is really a race car adapted to the road rather than road car adapted to the racetrack. If you have a look inside the bonnet, you can see that the weight distribution is virtually makes this a mid-engine front-engine car because the engine starts here, nowhere up there, but here, behind the chassis frame. And when you go to the back of the car, the petrol tanks start here. In other words, there's nothing behind there apart from the boot. The sills of the car are also petrol tanks. 
So all of the weight of the car is really between there and the front axle. Winner in its class at Le Mans in 1964 and 1965, the Bizzarini Strada, like so many other Italian sports cars, enjoyed a hugely successful racing career. It is the racing heritage of many Italian marks that upholds the myths surrounding the Italian sports car. Now this is a 1969 Ferrari 365 GTC. You see on the front a badge which I'm sure is familiar to most people. The prancing horse was originally the emblem of an Italian family who was one of the sons was a very famous World War I Italian fighter pilot. And he bestowed upon Enzo Ferrari the privilege of being able to use this motto, primarily because at that time Enzo Ferrari ran the Alfa Romeo Works Racing Team because there was no such car as a Ferrari in those days. And all Alfa Romeos then carried the racing ones that in a shield which said SF below it, which stood for Scuderia Ferrari. Prancing horses, historic victories, and flying aces. This is the stuff of legend, and legends make great stories. To give an example of their dedication, as I might put it, to the motor car, up until about four or five years ago, if you were driving in Italy and you were driving a nice car and it broke down in the middle of the night, there wouldn't be any question if you knocked on the chap's door about, oh, sorry, I'm asleep, come back tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock. He'd be down on the lathe that night, probably, trying to make a piece if he couldn't do it, mend the piece he'd already got, and put you back on the road as soon as possible. It wasn't for me he was doing it, it was for the car he was doing it. And that is in their blood. They love the car. The term classic car is almost indefinable. However, it is in Italy that we come closest to understanding its meaning. These cars have been embraced by Italians at the heart of Italian culture. But ultimately, it is the combined passion of the individual ingegneri and carrozzeria that has made these cars unique. In a time of large corporate takeovers, it is uncertain whether this organic artisan industry will survive. If not, these cars could be some of the last great Italian classics. <laughs>